Praise the Lord. Shall we rise up as we pray together? I want you to lift up your voice to the Lord and prepare yourself for the Bible study tonight. That the Lord himself will open your heart and drive away spiritual darkness. And bring in the light, the light of truth. The light of the knowledge of the world. That's what you hear tonight, you will understand. And as you understand, you apply your heart to wisdom. That your mind will rest on the promises of God. And the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Living an uncompromising life. In the face of danger and persecution. That the sterling example. Wonderful example they have given us in the world. Will be a challenge to your heart. And that when the time comes. For you to declare. Who you are. What you stand for. Then you will be taking that stand. On the authority of the word of God. Firm. Uncompromising. Fearless. Steadfast in the Lord. That persecution will not crush you. Now whatever you are going through now. At home. At school, the office, the market, in the community. That God will help you to hold out remaining steadfast and firm. That the grace of God will be sufficient for you to sustain you. And there will be no question about your love for God. No doubt about on whose side you stay. that God will make you focus on him concentrate on him that will keep you from wandering here and there in your mind in your thoughts And at these words that we learn week after week and day after day be a solid rock under your feet spiritually and God will help you to have the boldness of the righteous the firmness of the believer. Looking up to heaven. Receiving more grace, more strength to live. The life of the true disciple of Christ.
Let God find you dependable in the hour of trial, the hour of temptation, in the hour of persecution. Let God find you faithful, loyal, and true, brave. To confront whatever opposes the gospel of Christ in your life. Prepare your heart. Be ready. To live for his glory. To allow your light to shine. In the dark places of the world. Pray that the Lord will take you higher. Your Christian life. Your Christian comportment. Your Christian conviction. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will not bow to the threats or threatenings of the idolatrous king. This is your time that you too will not bend the knee or bow your head. You will not worship the idol of the land. The idol of the day, the idol of the age. He's willing to help you, he'll see you through. In Jesus' name we pray. Are you there? I said in Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we do thank you once again for bringing us safe and sound to the Bible study tonight. Thank you for all our brothers and sisters, all our young people, everyone here, and in all the locations where we're hearing your word tonight. Lord, we pray through this teaching of the word, you strengthen us for the hour of trial and temptation in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, the spirit of the conqueror that triumphs over temptation, trial, and trouble. Lord, we pray you grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. In the home where the Christian wife is suffering, in the home where the Christian believer, the husband, might be suffering, in the home where the children who believe in the Lord might be persecuted in the place of work, where the pressures and persecution may be there, in the community where your people are facing the fire or persecution of this day, Lord, we pray tonight you strengthen everyone in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, that you will not bow or bend under what, whatever kind of persecution. That, Lord, will be standing firm for you till the very end in Jesus' name. Holding fast the word of faith, the word of truth, which you have taught us. That, Lord, in every community, darkness will be dispelled before us. And the light will shine forth through us. And the people of the world, through your power, your protection, and through your glory in our lives, they will know that we are being with the Lord. Strengthen your people tonight, O Lord. And help us, Lord, when that hour comes, when we have to declare who we are, whom we serve. Lord, we pray, we will not cringe, will not be crushed, will not be conquered. I will be standing firm in the grace of the Lord, in the strength of the Spirit of the Lord, in Jesus' name. Be with everyone, Lord. Help us to become stronger 
as we study your word. In Jesus name we pray. We're looking at Daniel chapter 3 tonight. And once again, I welcome every one of you. I praise the Lord for those who are coming for the first time. And I pray that the study of the word will be beneficial to every one of you and every one of us in Jesus' name. In Daniel chapter 3, we've studied, uh, we have two studies already. And we've seen Nebuchadnezzar the king, the emperor. A tyrant, an idol worshipper, calling the whole nation, the whole dominion, the whole realm, all the places where he had any authority and any contact, calling them that he should come and worship the idol that he had set up. And the people were so afraid and so intimidated because he threatened them. He said, anybody that will not listen to him, anybody that will not fall down and worship his idol at that same hour, he'll be caught and then he'll be thrown into the burning fire. If one is of fire, then he said to these ones that will not bench, that will not bow, that will not give any attention to what he had said. He said, who is that God? That will deliver you out of my hand. That was a great question. A question he shouldn't have asked. Even in his, uh, in his wildest imagination. To challenge the God of heaven. That was a great thing. Coming out of the mouth of a creature on earth. And the Lord answered him by great great manifestation of his majesty, glory, and power. That's what we're looking at tonight. I want you to look at Daniel chapter 3, and I'm reading verse 15. Now, if ye be ready, at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, satri, and dulcima, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have set, which I have made well. What he meant by that is, I'll pardon you for your foolishness of the past, for not bowing down when I told you to bow down. If you will reconsider and then turn around and then you change your mind and change your decision and you bow down to worship my idol, that will be all right. I'll just overlook what happened in the past. Then you said, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning furry furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? That was a question he asked. It was the time of his madness. Spiritual madness. It was a time of foolishness for him. Spiritual foolishness. For him to ask a question like that. Even to think about something like that, to allow the thought in your mind, to challenge the almighty God. He was looking for trouble. He got it eventually. Some kinds of questions naturally provoke God to action. Such questions might intimidate fearful uh, people, but such questions embolden the people who are full of faith and they are faithful to their God. What a question he asked. It is a question that always provokes divine action. A question that produces supernatural miracle. A question that demands the manifestation of God's supremacy and God's extraordinary power. When unbelieving despots, tyrants, wicked people, when they ask such questions, God always responds to protect his own glory and then to silence such blasphemers. And then, you know what the people of God said? They said, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us out of your hand. I, I want to tell you that God has not changed. Today, he's still able. When persecutors threaten you, when idol worshippers threaten you, when evil people threaten you, whether they threaten you with words or with action, whether they threaten you or they look, 
or with their machinery, whatever it is, when the wicked people of the world, when they threaten you so that they can bend your will, bow your mind, make you fall down and worship them or worship their image, you can stand like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you can declare, my God whom I serve is able to deliver me and he will deliver me. And so eventually, when they answered him like that, he became more furious, became very much angry. And then that's what we're reading today. He threw them into the fire. See what happened. I'm reading from chapter 3, verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. And the form of his visage changed. He gave Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was once to be heated. He was very angry. In his anger, he lost his senses. He wanted to punish the people and he wanted the punishment to be very serious, to be very painful. Well, didn't you know that if you heat the furnace seven times hotter and you throw the people inside, they should die instantly. It will lessen the moment of their pain. It will lessen the period of their pain. His anger got into his brain and he forgot that. So you see, when people are angry, they forget their intention. And they forget the very purpose. But that's what he did. In verse 20, and he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to buy Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And to cast them into the burning fairy furnace. Wonderful that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not even resist. Now did they cry. Neither did they complain. Neither did they begin to pray a kind of prayer they had never prayed before. They were calm. They were composed. They were patient. They were peaceful. Looking for what God will do. Then in verse 21, these men were bound in their coats. And their hosing. And their hearts. And their other garments. And were cast into the, into the midst of the bony fairy furnace. Therefore in verse 22. Because the king's commandment was very, was urgent. And the furnace exceeding hot. The flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar lost some of his mighty men. The people that fight against the children of God, they are the people that will suffer. But the children of God will still remain alive. Even in the fire, even in the persecution, we're going to still remain alive in Jesus' name. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell down, bound into the midst of the burning furry furnace. Then the goodness of the king was astonished. He was surprised, short, and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men bound, lying down. Loose and walking in the midst of the fire. We can walk in the midst of the fire. Whatever fire this world is building up, whatever persecution, fairy persecution, this world is trying to make, and whatever instrument this world is trying to use to destroy your life, you can stand erect and walk and looking up as a person that has seen the glory of God. And you will walk in that fire in Jesus' name. It says, and you have no heart. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning furry furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. You know, now he said, God is the most high God. He realized, not even up to one day now, when he challenged God, just a few hours, 
that he challenged God. And then he knew that these Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were not just children of God, they were servants of the Most High God. And he told them to come forth, and they came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes and the governors and the captains and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Nor was there, was any air, was an air of their head singed. Neither were their coats changed. Nor the smell of the fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language who shall speak anything amiss against the gods of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be caught in pieces and their houses shall be made. It don't kill because there is no other God that can deliver after they sought. Amen. Yeah. He confessed it eventually. He was conquered. God will conquer every enemy. Yeah. Every persecutor. The Lord will conquer them in Jesus name. What happened to these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? After passing the test, after going through the furnace of fire, after taking an uncompromising stand, after living through that persecution, what then happened to them? The statue. Then the king did what? Promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. That is what the Lord is revealing to us. And the Lord is proving to us that He is able. If anyone challenges God in your life, that's the time for you to prove that the promises of God are still yes and amen. And you'll come out and come through triumphantly in Jesus' name. We well, divided the message tonight, the study tonight, to three parts. Number one, the persecution of non-conformists in the fairy furnace. The persecution of non-conformists in the fairy furnace. Number two, the protection of new creatures in the fairy furnace. The protection of new creatures in the fairy furnace. Number three, the promotion of noble conquerors after fearless faithfulness. The promotion of noble conquerors after fearless faithfulness. We're looking at number one, the persecution of nonconformists in the fairy furnace. These men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, actually they were young men and they were faithful. We call them nonconformists. Who are the nonconformists? The people that will not conform. To the principles of this world, who are the non-conformists? The people that will not conform to the practices of this world. Who are the non-conformists? The people that say no to the world. In Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's what they did. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, if we have to defend the truth, our very body, if we have to defend our conviction with our very life, if we have to defend what we're standing for with our very existence, that will do. Lord, we give our body to you as a sacrifice, if it need be. Those are the people who can stand. In the time of persecution. But you know the people that pet, pamper themselves. And the people that care too much about themselves. They are not willing to sacrifice anything. They are the people, they are like the jellyfish. They have no backbone. 
and he cannot stand. But you know the people who say, I don't care for anything. If I have it all right, if I don't have it all right, my time, my life, my body, everything, I'm willing to sacrifice so that I can defend the truth and the glory of the Lord. Those are the people that are victorious, that will present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not what? Conform. Those are the non-conformists. And be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're looking at three young men, Shadab, Meshach, and Abednego. They proved what is the perfect, acceptable will of God. By not conforming unto the world. Persecution will come. But God loves faithful, uncompromising believers. Not conformists who refuse to be conformed to this world are God's delight. Yet we must remember that the world and the God of this world, they hate whatever and whoever God loves. Nebuchadnezzar, the gentile king, was enraged by the refusal of these three faithful people to worship his image. In his rage, he, he made a strange and cruel scene. A kind of punishment that never anybody had seen in the world. And these saintly servants of God remain calm, patient, constant, peaceful in their devotion to God. They knew that God had power to deliver them from death. Or if he desired, he could take them to a better place than this world. He could deliver them from the despot forever. Because of that, they took their stand. And this Nebuchadnezzar the king, he was furious, was very angry. And a great intensity of the heat of his fury could not be satisfied without a great intensity of heat in the furnace. His anger was visible because we're told he in his rage was full of fury. And the form of his appearance, countenance, visage changed. He was betrayed in the whole comportment. And the countenance, eh, through that countenance, he ordered that the heat of the furnace be increased to the highest possible degree. Passion overdoes and defeats its own end, its own goal, its own purpose. Because the hotter the fire, the sooner were they likely to be put out of pain. But eventually, that's what he commanded. We need not be frightened by the rage, by the anger, by the fury, by the device of the persecutors. And you know, sometimes when you see people who are angry, then you become afraid. That's their nature. That's their nature. Dogs will bark. That's his nature. And the lions will roar. That's their nature. And the birds will fly. That's their nature. And sinners will get angry. That's all right. That's their nature. Sinners will sin. And when you don't please them, they'll show the anger. And so it shouldn't surprise you. What makes us a surprise is when you're looking for a sinner to be nice. And you're looking for an idol worshiper to be gentle. And you're looking for a Nebuchadnezzar to be calm and peaceful and loving. You're looking for, you're looking for something impossible. That's why I become shocked. But we need not be frightened. Of the rage or the fury or the device of the persecutors. After all, the persecution cannot burn us, cannot destroy us, cannot crush us. In that persecution, only what they use to bind us will burn away. Persecution purifies. Persecution preserves the true children of God. Persecution revives the dormant faith in, the, in some promises of God that have been forgotten. Persecution brings God's omnipotence and faithfulness nearer in manifestation. Persecution drives us to prayer. And persecution makes us to now depend on God more, more than ever before. Now I want to ask you a question. Who was the persecutor here? Who? Nebuchadnezzar. I'm asking another question now, but don't answer. I'll show you in the Bible. Who are the persecutors today? Because Nebuchadnezzar is gone. 
And many of us will not get to any king, any emperor. Many of us will not get to, to live with any president to persecute us. Who are the persecutors today? And let's look at Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 21 and verse 22. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. And the father the child. And the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Those are the persecutors today. Number one, they could be parents that will deliver their children to death. They will say, I wish the child will die. He's gone away from the religion in which he was born. He's going to take the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And so the father or the mother or the two together, they may persecute. Not only that, relatives or relations may persecute. Because it says, and the brother shall deliver brother to death. You know, sometimes it's your own brother, it's your own sister, it's the same person you are born out of the same place. That will persecute you because now you are following the Lord and it's shocking them that you are not following the family idol anymore. Sometimes it's the child that will persecute the parent. Jesus said so. Look at verse 21. It says, and the children shall rise up against their parents. Sometimes children, they persecute the parents, for the parents standing firm and saying, in this home, in this house, these will be the standard of righteousness. In this house, these will be the practice. It might be on some simple, simple things like dressing. It might be on some simple, simple things that this home, this house will not have all the gadgets of the world. The television. It might be on this on that. And then the children will bind up themselves. And then they are going to say, if this is going to be so, we're going to make life inconvenient for the parents. You know, persecution comes in various ways. But we're told in verse 22, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, I will endure to the end. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Let's look at John chapter 16. Who are the persecutors today? Because Nebuchadnezzar is not here to persecute you. Who are the people that may persecute you? That may stand in the place of Nebuchadnezzar? We're looking at John chapter 16, verses 2 and 3. They shall put you out of the synagogues, religious people. You are going to that church before, and uh, you discover that they were not preaching salvation. Now you've come to know the Lord as your personal Savior, and you are not going there anymore. And those priests, and those preachers, and those prophets, then they begin to persecute you and the people of that synagogue and that church. It says they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth service to God. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. Because they don't have salvation. That's why they persecute. I'm looking at John chapter 15 verse 18 all through to verse 20 if the world hates you you know that it hated me before it hated you if you were of the world the world will love his own but because ye are not of the world but i have chosen you out of the world therefore the world hates you the persecutor here is the world the worldly minded people because we don't want to take part in their parties. We don't want to take part in their idol worship. We're not taking part in their fashion. We're not taking part in all the things they delight in. The people of the world. And because we say we're going to please the Lord. And we're not going to please the men and the women of the world. Therefore the world will hate you. Remember verse 20. The word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me they will also persecute you. Yes, they will persecute. They are the people of the world. They are worldly people. Worldly minded people will persecute heavenly minded people. Galatians chapter 4. I'm reading verse 29. Galatians chapter 4. And we're reading verse 29. 
Here it says, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. So it is now. That's the description of persecutors. The people that are still of the flesh. They are not of the spirit. Anyone you see persecuting a believer, persecuting a child of God, that's of the flesh. It's not born again. And the works of the flesh will heed you. He said, as it was at that time, even so, it is now. He that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so, it is now. Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. The persecutors today. Acts chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God shall first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye, ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. The Jews didn't accept the word of God. And Paul the apostle became bold. He said, Now, you are the one that have put salvation away from yourself. And because you have rejected eternal life, you have rejected heaven, you have rejected the Savior, you have rejected the Lord, we are turning to the Gentiles. Verse 47, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have said thee, to, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for the salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles had this, they were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to have eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout honorable women and the chief men of the, of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. Who are the persecutors there? The jealous people, the envious people. They rejected the truth. They rejected salvation. And so Paul and Barnabas said, we're not going to be wasting our life and wasting our time. What well, the people that do not want the truth, all right, since you have rejected it, we turn to the Gentiles. And so they went to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles were so happy. They were so excited. And they received the word of life, and they became saved. When the Jews rejected the gospel, and they rejected eternal life, when they saw that the Gentiles got what they didn't have, they were jealous, they were envious, and the jealousy and the envy led them to persecution. You see, when people persecute, maybe you have something they, they don't have. And because you have something they don't have, that, that's the reason why they persecute. The jealousy leads them into that kind of persecution. Second Timothy chapter 3. In Second Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 12 all through to verse 14. Second Timothy chapter 3. We're reading from verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer what? Persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Who are the people that persecute? Evil people. Good people never persecute. Saved people never persecute. And the, the righteous people will never persecute. Daniel did not persecute Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Never. Shadrach did not persecute Meshach and Abednego. Never. It's the unbeliever. It's the wicked people. It's the evil people. It's the seducers that persecute. If you find anybody persecuting another person, that's an unbeliever. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned that and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now that we know the people that persecute, you know the reason why they persecute? Because we reject what they say. I want you to come back to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. And then you will see what happened here. 
and how Nebuchadnezzar handled the matter, how he responded and reacted to the thing that was happening. Daniel chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. And the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore, he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times hotter, more than it was wont to be heated. And that, that's the persecution there. And why did he persecute them? Why did he throw them into the fire? Oh, because they wanted to serve their God. They didn't steal. Did he commit adultery? Did he commit fornication? Did he embarrass the king in any other way? And did he hurt him in any way? They were good people, righteous people, believing people, faithful people, uncompromising people, nonconformists in the land. And that angered the king. That's all. That's all that angered him. They were good people, righteous people. They were pure people. They were people that were devoted and loyal to the God of heaven. And it says that devotion and loyalty to the God of heaven that made Nebuchadnezzar angry. Let me show you how it happens to other people in First Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19. I'm reading verses 1 and 2. First Kings chapter 19 verses 1 and 2 and he have told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. All that Elijah had done, you know the story. What did Elijah do? He prayed. Should we persecute somebody for praying? What did Elijah do? He stopped three and a half years of farming by his prayer. What did Elijah do? He brought the nation back to God. If God be God, worship him. If Baal, worship him. What did Elijah do? He prayed and fire came down from heaven. What did Elijah do? He stamped out false worship. Baal worship. Out of the land. That's all he did. It was to seek the glory of God. And that is why persecution arose. You see, in your own life, when you're standing for right choices, you pray, that's what they don't like. And then you stand for the truth, that's what they don't like. You exalt the glory and the majesty of the God of heaven, that's what they don't like. And you glorify the living God, the most high God, that's what they don't like. That's why they persecuted Elijah. And it says, and he have told Jezebel, all that Elijah had done and with that and with that how he had slain all the all the prophets with the sword then jezebel sent a messenger unto elijah saying so let the gods do to me and more also if i make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time chapter 21 of first kings first kings chapter 21 verse 2 and he have spake unto neighbors, saying, Give me the, the vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the wars of it in money. And Nabal said unto Ahab, The Lord forbid it me, that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. That's why they devised the means by which they were going to persecute him. That's all he did. That's all he did. He said, That's my inheritance. I'm not going to give my inheritance that I got from my father. I'm not going to give that to you. That's it. That's all. And that's why Jezebel and Ahab conspired together and then they wanted to get rich of the man. You have property, you have a house. And somebody says, can you sell the house? I'm sorry, I inherited this. This is what my heavenly father has given me to inherit. I'm not going to give it up. That's why they persecute. That's all. And God has given you. He's giving you life eternal. He's giving you some position. He's giving you certificate. He's giving you some good things in life. And then they want to take it away from you. You say, no. This is the inheritance from my father. I'm not going to give up this. That's why they persecute. Look at our girls, our daughters in the school. One boy says, give me your body. 
Hey, no, this is the temple of God. I'm not going to give my inheritance. I'm not going to give my purity unto any boy. I am for the Lord. That's why they persecute those daughters. And then a boy is, you know, walking with the Lord. And in this, these girls, they say, I want to be your girlfriend. And I want you to defile your body. And the boy says, never. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I'm not going to give my purity. I'm not going to give the holiness that Jesus Christ Christ purchased on the cross of Calvary. I'm not going to give that to any girl or any boy. That's why they persecute them. And as reason they still persecute today. If you know your inheritance, if you know your right, if you know your possession, if you know what God has given you, and the people of the world, they want that thing, and they want to just make it like rubbish and trample it on the ground, and you say, no, I'm not going to give that to anybody. That is why they persecute, but it's the persecutors that will suffer. Because the Lord will stand with us. If you are a non-conformist and you'll not bend, you'll not bow to the wishes of the enemy, the Lord will stay by you and the Lord will keep you in Jesus' name. We're well, going to the New Testament now, Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. We're looking at verse 17. Mark 6, 17. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake. His brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. That's all he said. What's wrong in that? That's good counseling. That's good counseling. Just because of counseling him, Herod, how could you do that? Your brother, Philip, are you not of the same parents? And then you take his wife, do unto others as you want them to do unto you. You wouldn't have loved it if he had taken your wife, would you? That's all he said. That's all he said. It is not right for you. It is not lawful for you to take your brother's wife. Therefore, Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him. But she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man. He knew. He knew he was a just man and unholy and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. But you know, it's because of preaching the truth and standing for the truth. That is why the persecution came. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. I'm looking at it from verse 19. What happened here is that Paul the Apostle eh, was going, or Silas. And then there was uh, this lady that had a familiar spirit, a spirit of divination. And then she was crying at Paul and Silas, saying, These are the men of God who show unto us the way of salvation. But Paul the apostle knew that these were the work of an evil spirit. And therefore he turned and said, Let that evil spirit come out of her. And eventually, uh, that lady was delivered. Let, let's look at it in, in Acts of the Apostles chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 18. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Look at what follows in verse 19. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. Well, if you read on, that's how the persecution came. Why? It tells us in verse 19, when they saw that the hope of their gains was gone. That's why they persecuted them. The hope of their gains gone. You are walking in a place and in that place where you are walking, before you came in there uh, the people, well, if they say they are going to buy something, uh, somebody will go out, they call them various names, they call them, say, 
maybe a purchase officer or whatever. And then as they go out, and something that is about 100,000 naira, they come back and bring a receipt of 800,000. On just that single deal, they want to make 700,000. And then you come in there, and you appear to have been working in another place before. You came to this new company. And then you see what they are saying. All these exorbitant receipts you say, no, it cannot be so. You go to the director and say, director, if we are spending like this, this company is not going to move forward. And so eventually they say, do you know where they sell this, where they sell that? Yes, I know. And then you go and buy it. They used to bring, a, you know, 900,000, 1.3 million receipt or whatever. And now you come back and it's just uh, about uh, 123,000. And then you have the receipt for it. And the same quality of what they have been buying before. And then they now say, okay, uh, you, looks like you know to make a good deal a good bargain and now they shift you to that section you are now the purchasing officer and you're going up and down buying those things you know what the other people will see that the hope of their gains is gone and because of that they'll persecute you and they'll, they'll see all manner of things about you if you are not, uh, you know, wise and careful, they might even go beyond just talking about you. And they might do some terrible things because of money. And because you have taken their hope of gains away from them. That's why they persecute. You know, it's because we are standing for righteousness. It's because we stand faithful and we say no. We're not going to cheat our company. We're not going to cheat our place of work. That's where we're getting our salary. We're going to be faithful. And that is what makes them angry. But whether they are angry or not, we stand for righteousness. And we're going to keep on defending the righteousness and the glory of God anywhere we find ourselves in Jesus' name. I want to tell you something. There are some believers now. They are they're now cringing and they have crawled into their kind of shed because they try to be faithful and when all those people saw that the hope of their gain is gone and they persecute them a little say oh i don't want to get into trouble after all it's not my money if they are taking the money from the company if they are taking the money from you know all those people and they are making all the unlawful gain that's their business and then you keep quiet because now they have conquered they have silenced you you are not like shadrach meshach and abednego you are terrified. You are trembling. You are intimidated. You are fearful. You are frightened. That's why you are no more standing. If you were like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you say, I don't care what they say. I don't care what they do. I don't care how they feel. This unlawful gain, as long as I'm in this company, it will stop and it will stop. And eventually, whatever their persecution, the Lord will exalt you and promote you. We're going to point number two now. We're looking at the protection. I'm saying the Lord will protect you. And the Lord will preserve you unto his eternal glory in Jesus' name. Point number two, the protection of new creatures in the fairy furnace. We're looking at Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. The protection of uh, new creatures in the furry furnace. In Daniel chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 23. It says in verse 23, And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound in the, into the midst of the bony furry furnace. Then, Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and he rose up in haste. And spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? Then answered and said, He answered and said unto the true king, He answered and said, Lo, I see. I see who? Four men walking in the midst of the fire. And they have no hurt. Nebuchadnezzar, you see yourself, you thought you could hurt them. I'll hurt you. I'll kill you. I'll destroy you. I'll persecute you. If you don't stop taking your stand for righteousness and holiness and being firm and steadfast in the truth, I will hurt you. You cannot hurt a child of God. 
I said nobody can hurt a child of God. Because only the will of God will be done. If the will of God is that your fire will not burn, your fire will not burn. Because the children of God will stand on the promises of God. And this is our Father's land. The earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof. And there any other person here, they are tenants in the house of our Father. We are the children of the Heavenly Father. And all those people that are just tenants on earth. And they are not, they are not even paying their house rent. And they are not paid to our Heavenly Father. The honor and the glory due unto Him. They are debtors. How can a debtor living in a father's house at a tenant who is not paying his due to the Heavenly Father? Then he is threatening us, the children of God. And he wants to drive us out of the house of our Father. It will never happen. I said it will never happen. We will keep on defending our father. How can I allow a mere tenant who is not even faithful enough to pay his house deal to insult my father and then he intimidates me. He wants me to join him to mock my father and insult my father. I say God forbid. And for you I say God forbid. We will take our stand. And eventually God convinced Nebuchadnezzar. And then he said, I see. And I see this man, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They have no heart. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. And then he says, then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning furry furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the most high God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, hey, look up here. Uh, before this time, in the first few verses, the idol was the center of attraction. And the idol was everything that everybody focused on. And the musicians, idolatrous musicians, were the people everybody focused on. At this point now, who is the center of attraction? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You will become the center of attraction. When you take your stand, when you say, I'm not going to bow, I'm not going to bend, they and their idol and their image may be the attraction now, the center of attraction now. But if you take your stand, when the Lord himself, when he will glorify his own name, and when he will preserve your life, and when God himself will fulfill his promise in your life, you will be the exalted one. You'll be the promoted one. You will not bend to them. They will come and see the glory of God in your life in Jesus' name. Then Shedan, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. And the princes and the governors and the captains and the king's counselors being gathered together. So these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an air of their head singed, Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. You see what God had done? He fulfilled his own promise. He will fulfill that promise in your life. In Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. I'm reading from verse 2. Isaiah 43 verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, when thou dost what? Walkest. They were walking in the fire. That's the promise God fulfilled for them. It will be fulfilled for you. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burnt. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, this, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopian Sheba, for thee. It tells us in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, we're reading it from verse 2. Exodus chapter 3, we're reading from verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire, out of the midst of a bush. And it says, and he looked, and behold, the bush 
burnt with, uh, with fire and the bush was not consumed. That's talking about the nation of Israel. Uh, you see um, Pharaoh tried to persecute them with real terrible persecution. It was like fire, but they were not consumed because the more he tormented them, and the more he persecuted them, the more they were growing. The more this world is against you, the more you are going to prosper. And the more you are going to grow. And you'll be going stronger and stronger, even in their persecution, in Jesus' name. Look at Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 12. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. The more they persecuted, the more they afflicted, the more they tried to put pressure on them, the more they made them do rigorous things. It says, the more they multiplied and grew. And then it says in the verse 12, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. We have read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let's see the New Testament commentary concerning them. In Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. Reading from verse 33. Hebrews 11 verse 33. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. The lions of this world trying to devour you because they don't like your righteous life. You silence them. And you will stop their mouths. Quench the violence of fire. Quench the violence of fire. And that's talking about the people we're reading of. That is about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we have the same promise of God today. That in the midst of persecution, in the midst of the furry furnace, the Lord will keep us faithful unto the very end in Jesus' name. I'm reading Matthew chapter 10 verse 29. Matthew chapter 10. We're looking at it from verse 29. Matthew 10 verse 29. It says, I am not too spy our soul for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But she, but the very ears of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Just like a cat, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And not an ear of their head was singed. The same thing the Lord is saying. Even the ears on your head, they are all numbered. And nothing will hurt you in Jesus' name. In Luke chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 17. Luke chapter 21. And we're looking at verse 17 and verse 18. Luke 21 verse 17. And ye shall be hated of all men. For my name's sake, but there shall not an heir of your head perish. Give me a good amen. amen. It says, and they'll hate you. Now, why are you afraid of people hating you? Because your thought, their hatred will take something away from you. Their hatred will make you lose something. But no, the hatred of the people of the world. Cannot make you to lose anything. It says, even the heirs of your head, they are all numbered. Not a single strain of the air of your head will perish because of the hatred of the people of the world. If the hatred of the people of the world are not effective, if they are useless, if they are worthless, if they can do nothing against you, why are you going to be afraid of something that cannot hurt you? Therefore, it means that whatever hatred it manifests, it will not take your prosperity away. It will not take your happiness away. It will not take the glory of God in your life away. It's a waste of their time. But they don't know. They don't know. It's a waste of their time to ever be after you, to want to hurt you. Nobody will be able to hurt you. Because they that are with us are more than they that be with them. In Jude verse 9. Jude we're looking at verse 9. And then you'll see the Lord's ability to be able to keep his own. Not Jude, I'm reading Second Peter, Second Peter. Open your Bible to Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. If you are godly, the Lord has the wisdom to deliver you and he will deliver you. 
And then it says, and to reserve the unjust, the sinner, the unrighteous, the unbeliever, until the day of, of judgment to be punished. The Lord is on your side. In Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 4, I'm reading verse 18. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver you from every evil work. And will preserve you unto his heavenly kingdom. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We're coming back to the Old Testament now. And we're looking at Second Kings. We're looking at Second Kings. Second Kings. I'm reading chapter 6. Second Kings chapter 6. And we're reading from verse, we're reading from verse 14. Therefore sent he, see the horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, and host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? What a question. Alas, my master, trouble is near. Persecution is near. The king of Assyria has sent his soldiers to come and arrest you and arrest us. We're in trouble. What shall we do? There's nothing to do. Christ has done everything. I said Christ has paid the whole price. Your protection, your preservation, your provision, everything you need. Christ has paid the whole price. What shall we do? That's not the, that's not the question. We rest in him. Rest in the arms of Jesus. Rest in the bosom of Jesus. He has done everything. Look at the next verse in verse 16. And he said, fear not. I come to tell you tonight, fear not. I said, fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. Look at verse 9, 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open their eyes, open his eyes, that she may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots and fire round about Elisha. The Lord will protect you. I'm looking at Psalm 34, Psalm 34. I'm reading from verse 7. Psalm 34, we're looking at verse 7. In Psalm 34, verse 7, I in answer to you, in response to what the man of God told the servant, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. The Lord will deliver you. Uh, there are precious promises we can never prove until we encounter some problems and some pressures. Uh, there is a kind of sweet juice of the grapes of grace, which can only be pressed out by the hand of providence. There are states of divine companionship, which can only be experienced when we find ourselves in situations where human companionship is impossible. Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who will fellowship with them in the fire? Nobody. Who will come to them and counsel them and help them and fellowship and co have companionship with them in the furnace of fire? Nobody except the Son of God. And there are some experiences you'll never be able to have until you get to that situation where only God, only Christ, only the Son of God, only the Savior, your Lord and Master can be in partnership, in companionship with you. There is a depth of divine love and intimate fellowship known only to the believers who's Courageous, who courageously face the opposition of the world against righteousness. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a fresh understanding of divine, a fresh understanding. By that persecution and by staying in that fire, they had a fresh understanding. Number two, they had a divine contact and companionship. What if they were not in the fire? What if they had compromised? What if they benched the knee? What if they said, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, we're sorry about it. Give us another chance and we'll do what you want. They will never have seen this great companionship and intimate fellowship with the, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, it gave them an intimate fellowship. Number four, a new revelation of God's power. 
who knew that Isaiah chapter 43 verse 2 could be fulfilled literally until these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego took their stand and they stood for righteousness. Not only that, number five, it gave them an experience of security and immunity. Number six, a fulfillment of an incredible promise. And then number seven, a supernatural sign and wonder in the furnace which they could not, which they could not have if they were outside the furnace. They lost nothing inside the furnace. They lost nothing inside the persecution. They lost nothing through the anger of Nebuchadnezzar. But on the other hand, they gained incalculable spiritual wealth. They gained immediate as there was, and they gained heavenly and dear heavens and daring recognition. We lose nothing in the furnace of persecution. Rather, our profit and rewards are abundant in this present life and also in eternity. We're told that Nebuchadnezzar was surprised. He was astonished. He was amazed at what happened. And notice what he said. Number one, he said, Did we not cast three men bound into the fairy furnace? Now I see them loose. They are free. They are at liberty. Number two, he said, I see them walking in the fire. Number three, and he said, And they have no hurt, you know. I examine them. I see them. And there is no hurt. Then number four, he said, I, The form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And then he called the men to look at them. And those men, number five, when he saw them, they saw that the power, the fire had no power on them. Number six, they saw that not even an air of their head was seen. Number seven, neither was their coat changed. And then number eight, there was no smell of the fire that passed on them at all. You see, as they took their stand, that became an instruction, an encouragement in the climax of the king's confession and declaration. He said, there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Any God like our God? Any Savior like our Savior? Any companion like our companion? Any Redeemer like our Redeemer? There's no Redeemer like our Redeemer. There's no rock like our rock. And there's no defender, protector like a defender and protector. He will preserve you and he will help you through life in Jesus' name. Before I move on to the next point, I want to just show you something in passing. Don't forget this. We're looking at Daniel chapter 3, verse 22. Daniel chapter 3, verse 22. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the phone is exceeding hot. The flame of the fire slew who? Those men, those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The flame of the fire slew them. Look up here, brothers and sisters. I'll be afraid to run that kind of errand for Nebuchadnezzar. You want to do it. You want to touch the nature of the Lord. Go and do it yourself and face the concept. Don't send me. Don't send me. To touch the anointed of the Lord. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, there are people, they don't think that what the other people, the king himself will not do. And what uh, this uh, Pharaoh will not do. And what the Herod will not do. They will send, they will say, go after them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Don't send me. I don't want to endanger my life. If anybody sends you to go and hurt Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, say no, I cannot do it. Go and do it yourself. And go and face the fury and the wrath and the judgment of God. Those who run errands for the wicked people. Those who run errands for the seducers. Those who run errands for the persecutors of the children of God. They are the people that were born. If they don't born here, in the fire here, they'll go to the lake of fire, hell, fire forever and ever. Why are you going to go to hell and stay in the fire because of another person's errand? If you go to hell by the sea, you commit yourself, we understand. But the sin that Nebuchadnezzar wanted to commit, and he said, I'm going to destroy Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he didn't do it himself, and you are his messenger, you are his servant, that will go and lay hold on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and bind them, and then try to throw them into the fire. They died prematurely. They said, you know, when they were leaving home in the morning, they said, my wife, children, I'll be coming back. Then, before they came back, Nebuchadnezzar said, before you go back home, go and do this. Go and uh, follow this errand. And then they followed. And they were the people to burn first. 
I pray you will not die a premature death. Uh, you know, there are times that uh, some people say they have an evil spirit. And then they want to touch a man of God, a woman of God, a child of God. And then they want to send this boy or this girl. And they say, you see that man there? Go after him. Ah, don't do it. If they want to do it, let them go themselves. Because that is fire. I said that is fire. Because he that touches the anointing of the Lord, he touches the apple of his eye. Don't let them send you. Because that can, lend, that can lead you into hellfire prematurely. These people died prematurely. You will not die prematurely. I come to point number three. The promotion of noble conquerors after fearless faithfulness. We're looking at Daniel chapter 3 from verse 28. Daniel Chapter 3, verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are sent his angels. Who are sent who? His angel. And delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which uh, speak anything amiss against uh, the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be caught in pieces and their houses shall be made a donkey hill because, because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort. Eventually, Nebuchadnezzar spoke and he blessed the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He had earlier said, Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Now, he has come to realize the existence of that God. He has come to realize the power of that God and his involvement in the affairs of men on earth. He referred to God as the most high God. Who has no equal? He has no rival. He has no comparison. For he said, there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. The manifestation of God's presence and the demonstration of God's power changed the king's mind. God's faithfulness and response to our faith can change the attitude and life of the most idolatrous, wicked sinner. If you will take your stand, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego took their stand, you too, you can become an agent of the majesty and the glory of God. That because of your stand and because of your faithfulness and truthfulness, then the people of the world, they will say there is no other God that can deliver after this sort except the God of heaven. Nebuchadnezzar's God could not deliver or protect the most mighty men that threw those men into the fire. But the Most High God delivered his own servants that trusted him, who would not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Dead idols are impotent. Dead idols are powerless. Dead idols are worthless. But the living God is all-powerful, almighty, omnipotent. Truly, there is no other God that can deliver after they sought. So, he blessed God. God for his goodness and his power. But let's notice something about Nebuchadnezzar. See this kind of testimony he gave. And that sound doctrine. Nebuchadnezzar's praise. Nebuchadnezzar's confession concerning God was doctrinally sound. Not only that, it was widely publicized. He announced everywhere. He said, there is no other God like this. Nebuchadnezzar, that's true. But Nebuchadnezzar, I have a question for you. If you make that public confession, that public declaration, there's no other God like this, what are you doing to your image? You know, you must carry everything to the practical, logical conclusion. When you say something, you follow it through. If you say there's no other God that can deliver. Like this God, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I want to see the logical conclusion and the practical conclusion. Bring that image down, smash it, crush it, and throw it away. Then I will know that your testimony is for real. That's telling us something. There are some people like Nebuchadnezzar. They can say the right thing. 
they can quote the right word. And they can talk doctrinally sound. And if they can even publicize it, they can stand up in, in the assembly of the people of God and say, there is no God that can deliver after this sort. And yet, they will not follow it through and repent of their sin. And yet, they will not follow it through and abandon their idol. And yet, they will not follow it through and destroy all those evil things they raised up. And that's why the Lord said, look at Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. And we're looking at verse 31. Ezekiel 33 verse 31. And they come unto thee as the people come it. And they see it before thee as my people. And they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouths they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. See that? That's Nebuchadnezzar. And many people are like, not like Nebuchadnezzar today. They go to assemblies, they go to conventions, they go to convocations, they go to retreats, they go to whatever it is. And then over there they, they raise up their hands and they say, this God is great and this God is wonderful. I'm going to tell it everywhere. And they publicize it everywhere. Sometimes they say it on television, sometimes on radio. And they say it everywhere for everybody to hear I about the idol at home. How about the idol in the heart? How about the sin? How about the polygamy? How about the many women? How about the stealing? How about all the things they're hiding? Carry the confession to a logical conclusion. Don't just say it with the word of mouth. That was the problem of Nebuchadnezzar. He said it with the word of mouth. He did not follow it through with his life. In Isaiah chapter 29, I'm reading verse 13. Isaiah chapter 29. And we're looking at verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as these people draw near with their mouth and with their lips, do honor me, but removed their heart far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among these people. Even a marvelous work. And a, and a wonder for the, work, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. You see that there are some people that go to some meetings today. Sometimes I think it's for political reason. When you have, you know, thousands and thousands of, you know, children of God gathering somewhere and then you feel that, oh, these people are very many. If I can just go there and identify with them, I think if I need to be voted for, I'll be voted into office again. I think that's why some of these people go there. And then they might make a public declaration, this God is wonderful and this God is mighty. There's no God like this. Hey, I heard that before from Nebuchadnezzar. His heart did not change. His mind did not change. His idol worship did not change. Show that you are greater than Nebuchadnezzar and abandon the idol. That's what God is looking for. It's not looking for people that will just say it by the word of mouth. It's looking for the people that will have a change of life and except he be converted, except you be born again and your life is turned around you'll not be able to get to the kingdom of god i will not be like nebuchadnezzar you carry your confession you carry your declaration to the logical conclusion you say since there is no god apart from this god the image i set up i smash it i destroy it i get it out of the way i'm going to serve the lord then we know that your testimony your proclamation declaration your confession is for real matthew chapter 7 verse 21 in matthew chapter 7 we're looking at verse 21 it says not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that what? Doeth. It's not just to say it. Nebuchadnezzar could say it. Who cannot say it? Anybody can talk. Anybody can publicize. Anybody can proclaim. Anybody can make any confession. But to do it, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that Doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. I pray will be doers in Jesus' name. I come back to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, and I'm reading the last verse there, verse 30. Then 
The king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. The time of your promotion is coming. You see, after you take your stand, after you say, no, I'm not going to worship their idol. I'm not going to yield. I'm not going to compromise. I'm going to be a new creature, a noble conqueror, a non-conformist. And then you take that stand and you say, I will not compromise with the world. Whatever they say, whatever they do, and however they're going to act, here is where I stand. After that kind of stand, after that kind of rigid, rigorous, righteous living, the Lord will promote you. Because you see, promotion does not come from the east or from the west. Promotion is from the almighty God himself. We're looking at Psalm 75, and I'm reading verse 6 and verse 7. Psalm 75, we're looking at verse 6, Psalm 75, and we're reading from verse 6. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. I pray God will set you up. When you oppose the world, you oppose the corruption in the world, you oppose all the compromise, compromising spirit in the world, and you have the spirit of a conqueror and the spirit of a non-conformist, a new creature, a noble conqueror. And say, so I'm going to stand for righteousness, and you keep on standing. At the end of it, all promotion will come. In Psalm 91, I'm reading from verse 14. Psalm 91, verse 14. Because... He has set his love upon me. Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high. Because he has known my name. He shall call upon me. And I will answer him. God will answer your prayer. I will be with him in trouble. He will be with you in that trial. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. Premature death? I said premature death? No. That's what Nebuchadnezzar wanted for. He said, you'll die before your time. I told you to bow down to the idol. And you're not bound. I will so torment you. I'll throw you into that very furnace. And you will die before your time. And the people who see you die before your time, they'll never dear me anymore. But do you see that they didn't die? You will not die. Nebuchadnezzar is not mighty, not powerful enough to kill you, you will live your full days. Because it's for the people that are faithful, it's for the people that dwell under the shadow of the Almighty, and they say, I'm not going to compromise, I'm not going to go back to the world, I'm going to take my stand for the Lord. Those are the people, and the Lord will see that you have that long life in Jesus' name. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. He will show it to you. In Genesis chapter 41, Genesis, I'm reading chapter 41, verse 39. Genesis chapter 41, verse 39. It says, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God has showed thee all this, and there is, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art, thou shalt be over my house. And according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. You know the persecutors, here comes the dreamer. Let us kill him and see what will become of his dream. They wanted to kill him, but God said no. If God says no to your enemy, there's nothing they can do. If he says no to Satan, there's nothing he can do. And if he says no to those people having the power of darkness over anybody, but not over you, it, it will not hold. God said no to the persecutors of Joseph, and now God promoted him, God will promote you. All the Lord is waiting for is that you'll take your stand. You will not compromise with the people of the world. You'll say here I stand. I'm not going to bend. I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to yield to the will of Nebuchadnezzar or an idol worshiper or to the will of society. I'm going to do the will of God all my life and the Lord will be by your side. 
Why don't you stand up and tell the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm going to take my stand. And I'm going to keep on standing for righteousness. And it's contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints. I'm not going to allow the threats of Nebuchadnezzar or Pharaoh or Herod or anybody to so frighten me, intimidate me that I'll be crushed under their boots. I'm going to stand for righteousness. Only then will the Lord himself promote you, protect you, preserve you. Only then will the promises of God be yes and amen in your life. Stand up and tell the Lord, oh Lord, I thank you for what I've learned today. I thank you for what I've learned. I'm going to take my stand. And I'm going to stand for righteousness. I'm going to hold on to the truth. I'm not going to allow anything to sway me, anything to discourage me, anything to destroy my stand. I'm going to stand. The Lord will be with you. The Lord will abide with you. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord, and say, Lord, thank you for my salvation. Thank you for bringing me to the gospel. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done, what you have done, what you have done in my heart, in my life. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the transformation. Thank you for making me a new creature in Christ, a new creature, a non-conformist. You tell the Lord, the world is trying to bend you, bend your will. The Lord is, the, the world is trying to make you bow, and the Lord is trying to, the, the world is trying to make you bend. And you're saying, oh no, I'm not going to bend to them. I'm not going to bow to them. I'm going to stand for my Lord. Keep on standing and the Lord will help you. Keep on standing. Standing for righteousness. Standing for the truth. Standing for the faith once delivered unto the state. Don't just stand with proclamation, with confession. Don't just stand with uh, promoting and, uh, and publicizing. With your very life. Your very life. Saying, I'm going to be righteous. When they are doing what they are doing. And when they are going the way they are going. And when they are going after the world. I'm not going to go after the world. I'm not going to go after the world. I'm going to stand for righteousness. And then the Lord will uphold you. And the Lord will preserve your life. Tell the Lord, the challenges are there in your office. The challenges are there in your community. The challenges are there in your home. The challenges are there in your family. The challenges are there among the men and the women around you. And they want to bend you. They want to crush you. They want to make you compromise. They want to make you unfaithful, disloyal to the teaching of the word of God. They want to make you a wishy-washy churchgoer, a compromising Bible carrier, a bench warmer in the church. And they want to make you as, as defiled, as sinful, as backsliding as them. But no, you are going to take your stand. You wake up today, you wake up today and say, Lord, now I know, now I know, now I know. Where the promotion lies, where the preservation lies, where the, where the preservation, the provision of the Lord, where it lies, is on the side of the people that will not compromise. Take your stand, take your stand. Don't allow any intimidation, don't allow any kind of frightening, don't allow any kind of threatening. Take your stand and say, here I stand. I will not do otherwise. And the Lord will be with you. The Lord will be with you. The Lord will be with you. It's on the side of those who refuse to bow to the enemy. Those who refuse to bow to the devil. Those who refuse to bow to the idol worship. Tell the Lord in the hour of trial, help me and make me stand. In the hour of temptation, help me and make me stand. In the hour of the threatness of the people of the world, help me and make me live an uncompromising lie. They cannot hurt you. They cannot hurt you. What can they do? The very ears of your head are all numbered. Don't hear what they say. Hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Don't listen to their threatenings. Listen to the promise of the Almighty God. I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. When you walk through the fire, I will be with you. And the flame shall not kindle upon you. Listen to what the Almighty God is saying. 
He was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said, I will be with you. He was with Daniel in the lion's den. And he said, I will be with you. Live for righteousness. Live for purity. Yes, the people are there. The people of the world. Those who are born after the flesh. Those who are fleshly. Those who are worldly. Those who are carnal. They'll try to persecute those who are born after the spirit. But the persecution means nothing. Go ahead and live for God. And live for Jesus. And live for his glory. And exalt him. And honor him. And let your light so shine before men. That they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. They might ask a big question, a great question. And say, who is that God? Leave them alone with God. And just say, I'm not going to answer your question. Whatever it be. I'm taking my stand for righteousness. Whatever it be, here I stand. I'm not going to compromise. You tell the Lord, you're not going to go back to the world. You're not going to compromise your stand. You're not going to yield to the enemy. You're not going to surrender your heart, your life, your will, your faith, your, your consecration, your commitment. You're not going to surrender that to Nebuchadnezzar. His fire means nothing. His threatening means nothing. Stand for the truth. Let's know where you stand. Let's know where you stand. Don't be one leg out there, one leg in here. Let's know where you stand. In the day, in the night, when you smile, when you frown, when you threaten, when you promise. Whatever they say, whatever they do. Let's know where you stand. That you're on the Lord's side. That you're on the side of righteousness. You're on the side of purity. You're on the side of holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Give your life to the Lord. And let that life stay, remain, abide with the Lord. Now you know they cannot hurt you. Now you know there's nothing to fear. Now you know the Lord is on the side of the people that stand for truth and righteousness. What are you waiting for then? If you bench the rule a little before, you bow down a little to them before, go back and reverse that compromising situation. Go back and now take your stand that the people will know where to find you. When they're looking for people who are faithful, who are righteous, who are pure, who are non-conformists, then they will know you are the man, you are the woman, you are the boy, you are the girl. No fear in your heart. No intimidation making you to tremble, making your feet to knock together. What can Nebuchadnezzar do beyond what he has done? And he failed, and he always fail. Tell the Lord this is a time to have strength. This is a time for the Lord to give you courage, commitment, conviction. So that as you go back home, whatever they say, you are standing erect and standing firm. For righteousness. When you go back to the place of work this week, you are taking your stand. And those who see that they lose their hope of gain, unlawful gain. Because now you have exposed their fraud, their theft. You have exposed, they're making a lawful gain in that company. 
They might persecute you, say some things against you. It does nothing. Be righteous. And let the people know you are not going to sell your salvation, your birthright because of money. And remember, those who run errands for Nebuchadnezzar, they are the people that will burn their fire. And if any sinner sends you to run errands for them, to bind up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, don't you do it. If they want to do it, let them do it themselves. And face the fury, the indignation of God, the wrath of God, the judgment of God. Those who run errands for Nebuchadnezzar, those are the people that go to hell first, hellfire first. They are the people that die prematurely. But the men of God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, will abide, will remain strong, healthy, sound, nothing evil happening to them. Only those who run errands for Nebuchadnezzar, those are the people that will face the judgment of God. Come out from among them and now take your stand on the side of the people who love God, of the people who love righteousness, of the people who are holy and righteous and pure. Say, Lord, I'm sorry for the past. Now in this present day, now in this present time, now in this present hour, I'll be standing for the truth. No more compromise. No more trembling. No more shaking. From now I give myself unto you. From now I'm going to let my light shine. I'll no more hide my light under the bushel. I'm going to stand. Stand for righteousness. Be an example to all the people like Shidrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are good examples for us today. We're learning about them. We're encouraged. Let others hear about you and be encouraged. Let others learn through you and be encouraged. Let others see your life and be encouraged. Let others see that you are 100% through and through for righteousness, for holiness, and be encouraged. Let others see your boldness. The righteous is as bold as a lion. Let them see and be encouraged. Don't be like Nebuchadnezzar after seeing that miracle. Miracle of protection, miracle of preservation. Then he made a proclamation. An announcement. Empty proclamation. Worthless announcement. He didn't destroy his idol. It was only word of mouth. He didn't carry that to a logical conclusion. Practical conclusion. Break down every idol. Destroy every idol. Every image. Carry your confession, your proclamation, your decision to a logical conclusion. I am for the Lord from now on through and through. 100%. My soul, my spirit, my heart, my mind, my body, my family. Everything all for the Lord. Carry it to a logical conclusion. Let your friends know. Let your enemies know. Let your neighbors know. Let the co-tenants know that here is where you stand now. Not standing one moment and then bending the other moment. Make it constant. Make it permanent. Make it real. Abiding. And don't yield to the pressure of those who do not know the Lord, who do not follow the Lord. Be pure, be righteous, be holy, be firm, 
Be steadfast. Be a nonconformist. Be a noble conqueror. Live the life of a new creature. The protection, the provision, and the promotion will come. 